Wow. Man, good to have you, Garrett Miley. So good to have you. Um, if you are joining us online, good to have you with us t- uh, today. If you're watching this later or if it's by podcast, uh, some of the information I'm going to share here at the beginning is somewhat dated and stuff, so it's really applicable to right now. Uh, if you are new or this is your first time with us or maybe first time back in a long time, what a great time to be here. God's doing some incredible things here at the bridge. And so we have been Uh, in this uh, teaching series called Stretch because we feel like God is stretching us and is calling us to stretch out. And we are launching a campus in Dahlonega. Uh, We actually have the uh, vision and dream to launch additional campuses after that. But we're starting in Dahlonega and we'll have some preview services that are starting in the fall. We'll have uh, full Christmas services in December, um, the grand opening in January. But again, things will be going on before then uh, for the people who live in Lumpkin County and Dahlonega. Uh, next week, uh, this or excuse me, next week, no, it's next Saturday, this coming Saturday, we have a sneak peek. So it's Saturday the 22nd. It's a drop-in from 4 to 6, and we want all of you, those of you who may be watching this at home or those of you who are just in the area, we want all of you to be able to come by. Now, this isn't something that, you know, hey, we're like advertising this to the entire community out in Lumpkin County. Of course, if you're there watching this, come on. Uh, But this is an opportunity for you as the Bridge Church family to get a preview of the building and the renovations that we've been doing in there. Uh, You'll see the location. You'll you'll see all the challenges that we have before us and additional renovations that need to be done. Um, But again, four to six, we'll take you on a tour uh, as you come in in different groups and answer all the questions you've got. Um, As you uh, are leaving today at the information counter out there in the lobby, we have these one page overview of the project and what we're doing. Uh, We handed these out a couple of weeks ago, but if you weren't here and didn't get one or if you need to pick up another one, they will be there at the information table. Um, But I've asked uh, some of our greeters and uh, different ones to be passing out little cards like this, okay? Uh, So as they're coming around right now, just we want everybody, um, you know, everybody like husbands and wives, that means each one of you. We want, you know, if you're a teenager kid in here, you get one too. We want everybody to have one of these because I'm going to be talking about this and I want you to have one in your hand. Hopefully you also have a bracelet. You got one of those when you came in because today it's more than just a like a little memento about stretch. It's an object lesson. So you're going to need probably your bracelet or something like that bracelet. So just go ahead and grab one. If you say, I didn't get a bracelet, just tell them, I didn't get a bracelet. And they'll bring you one, Okay. But this is our, you know, giving card. It's, uh, we call it a commitment card. And if you open this up on the inside, you'll see the scripture right here on the top that's printed on the bracelets that's really been somewhat of the inspiration behind what we're doing. You know, it says that we're to enlarge the place of our tents and that we are to stretch open, you know, the curtains and we're lengthening the cords because God is adding to our family. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're stretching ourselves to go into other communities. But if you will look, this is the the financial side, the commitment card of what we're going to be able to do each financially so that we'll know what we can do collectively. Now, we have a goal, and the goal is $500,000 that's above and beyond our normal giving. And what I mean by that is if you normally, let's just say you normally give $25 a week, or maybe you give something like, you know, $200 a month, that's your normal giving. We want you to keep doing just what you're doing because of that. We're already ahead of the game, and because of that, we're able to do so many different ministries, not only here in the church, but to our community and really around the world. So your normal giving, just keep doing what you're doing the way you're doing it, okay? But above and beyond that, if you can give a little extra for the next year, for one year, if you can give a little bit extra, whether it's weekly, monthly, or maybe as a one-time gift, our goal is to raise $500,000 above and beyond our normal giving in one year, which may sound kind of daunting, but we already have $200,000 that has been received and, or committed to this goal. So that means what I'm asking you, church family, and even those watching online, if you consider this church family or if you just think the Bridge Church is effective in what we do and you want to help us, that means our goal that's left is $300,000. We need $300,000 from the rest of our church family in order to meet that $500,000 goal. And again, it's above and beyond. Now, 500,000 or even the 300,000 may seem huge to some of us, but this, can I tell you, statistically speaking and just knowing our giving trends and data and all that kind of stuff, this is very doable. Dare I say it, this is something that it's not going to require a miracle of God. It's just going to require some of us to stretch. It's very doable. But our vision is much bigger 
than this goal. Our vision is far bigger than what $500,000 will cover. Because like I've said, we're starting in Dahlonega. We feel as if God has brought the opportunity to us to do something in Clarksville and over in Habersham. And then I've been sharing for years the burden and the, the just kind of the angst that I have about doing something for Hispanics and having a, a, a Spanish-speaking congregation. There's nothing in White County. The only thing in White County that is, uh, as far as church for Spanish-speaking people is there's a service that's offered at the Catholic Church. But I want to have more than a service. I want to be able to have a complete church with all of the ministries and all of the outreach and everything else that goes on. So we've got an ambitious vision, an ambition goal that is so much bigger than 500000 So here's the thing. If we exceed this goal, which is very doable, it just accelerates how fast we can go on the vision. If we exceed the goal, we accelerate our pace on the vision. We can launch those others faster. So I'm going to ask you that you would do that because we believe, listen, we believe that it's not about being bigger. Okay, I want you to understand this isn't an ego thing and it's not about being bigger. It is about being the best stewards we can, the best managers we can of all the opportunities and all the resources that God has blessed us with and given us for his purpose. And we believe a big part of his purpose and his will and his agenda is to plant churches. And what I mean by churches, it's not necessarily the buildings and, you know, the organization. I mean these hubs, these centers, these places where people come together to discover God, to move closer to God, to be transformed, and, and to move together to impact the community for his good and for his glory and for what he's doing. That's what a church is. It's a gathering of people that becomes a movement. And this is exactly what Jesus was doing. He said that he came to, to start churches. He said, upon this rock, you know, the declaration that he is the son of God, the savior of the world, he would you know, call people together, form a movement called the church, and the gates of hell would not stop it. So we know that that's his agenda. That is now our agenda. And it's not about being bigger. It's about being the best stewards with these opportunities that literally have come to us. It's not that we went out searching for them. They literally have come to us. And so that's an opportunity God's given us. There's resources and blessings and, and people and skills and talents God's given us. And we want to be the best stewards of that in order to accomplish his mission. So if you'll look at the inside of this card, here's how I want you to fill this out, okay? If you say, okay, whatever your normal giving is, just keep doing that, all right? But if you say, what can I do maybe monthly? Some people, we think monthly. And you may say, I can give an extra 50, 100, 250, or whatever a month above and beyond my current giving. Just write that in the top. Or some of us think weekly. We get paid weekly or maybe bi-weekly, so we think weekly with our budget. You can say, okay, well, this is what I can do weekly, an extra 10, 15, 25, whatever it is weekly that you can do above and beyond for one year, right? And then there's this place down here, which is in addition, maybe it's a one-time gift. We've had some people who've just said, you know what? I've got some reserve funds or we've had some business owners and those who, you know, get bonuses at the end of the year or maybe they have a, a you know, a year in kind of, uh, when they do their books, they have kind of a surge of income that they look at at the end of the year and they just say, I'm just going to do a one-time gift. So what we say is you do monthly or weekly and then if you have a one-time gift or if you just say, I've just got a one-time gift, that's what I can do. That's fine. However you do that. I'm just going to ask you to stretch and do a little bit more. So if you say, hey, normally I give 25 bucks a week, but I will stretch and I'm going to put $10 in here. I'll take $10 more a week. Some of you say, well, I don't give anything. Well, then stretch and do something, <laughs> right? Do something, whether it's a one-time gift or whether it is monthly, weekly, or a combination of the one time and one of those. Now, you don't have to fill these out today, okay? I, you can take them with you. You can have discussions, conversations about them with your, your spouse or your family or whatever you have to do or your bookkeeper or whatever, okay? Um, but next Sunday is Stretch Sunday. Next Sunday is when we're all going to fill these out together, or you can bring it back and turn it in next Sunday. So next Sunday is Stretch Sunday. If you're not going to be here next week and you want to drop it off early today, you can do so, okay? You just fill this out, drop it in the little giving stations, which are, you know, these boxes that are on stands as you're going out the door. You can drop it in there, okay? And we'll have it, or we'll be doing this. Some of you who are watching and you say, well, hey, I won't be there next Sunday, but I'll there the week after. We'll have these in the seats for several weeks until we can all participate, and then I will be glad to come back and announce and tell you what we've done. Now, I'm going to be honest. I know, I realize, just this conversation and handing you this card creates tension. I get that. You know, especially when you're standing up here and going, gosh, I hate it when you go to church and they talk about money, right? 
It's not usually the visitors and the guests and the outsiders and the non-believers who feel that way. It's the Christians who know we should be generous in giving that feel that way, okay? So I get it. That creates tension. And then you put a card in my hand, and then you give me specific instructions and give me a date and a deadline and all this kind of stuff. And now I've got all these people around me, and it's like, why do you do this? This feels so manipulative, and it feels so whatever. I get all of that. I feel it too. It's tension. I know whenever... We start into something like this before I ever talk to the staff, ever talk to the elders, before I even talk to my wife. I'm sitting down looking at our finances and saying, I cannot ask them to do something I'm not willing to do myself. And I start feeling the tension. Well, that's what stretching is, isn't it? It's tension. If I was to say, let's all stand up right now and touch our toes, we would all feel the tension, some more than others. (laughs) But we'd all feel tension, right? Right? And so I get it, and that's why I wanted to give you these little bands, right? When I said, I want something that, whether they hang on the refrigerator, stick in the car, do whatever, I want them to be able to to see this during the week, and it just spark your heart and your mind to remember and to reflect. And I thought, okay, let's do this, because this is stretching. And and, and now listen, some of you understand if you have anxiety that there's these little bracelets that you can get for anxiety, and whenever you're having anxiety, you just go, right? And for some reason, that little bit of pain is supposed to redirect your attention away from the anxiety. Some of you right now are like, I mean, it's just like you can't can't pluck that thing enough, right? Okay. I get it. And so I understand tension because we're going to feel the tension, right? And so that's why I want you to have the bracelet so that we can just embrace the tension. Now, some of you, bracelet's not enough. You need something more like this. Okay. (laughs) This is more of what's going on in your life right now, (laughs) right? I mean, it's way more than a little bracelet of tension. It's like, right? And if you let go of that, somebody's getting hurt, right? Now, just hold on, okay, because this entire message is not about these cards. This entire message is not going to be about the campaign. But if you are part of our church family, or if you, again, just think that the church is effective and efficient and, you know, you, you care about what goes on here, yes, it is about the cards. I get that. But it's, there's so much more. There's so much more bigger things that are more personal in your life that have nothing to do with those cards or even what we're doing in Dahlonega. And if you'll just pay attention, I believe the Holy Spirit will use what I'm talking about to make it very personal and very applicable for you. Now, let me also warn you, especially if you're like new here, visiting here, and you're not familiar with me, there's going to be a long setup before I ever get to the Scripture. And some of you go, gosh, do they even believe the Bible and teach the Bible here? And the longer I go with the setup before I get to the Scripture the greater the tension will be in your life. We've had somebody once before, maybe y'all were here on that Sunday and a young man sat over there and I was about, you know, 10 minutes into the message. He got up holding his Bible, walking out saying, preach the word. And I'm thinking, I'm trying, dude, give me a moment, right? Because I was just doing the setup, but the longer it takes for me to get to the scripture, for some of you, the more tension you're going to have. Bear with me, we'll get there. It's also part of the illustration, right? (laughs) But here's the thing. When we talk about tension, tension exists in our life when there's people objects or ideas that are connected but seem to be moving and pulling in different directions. So when you've got two people, a friend, a co-worker, a neighbor, an enemy, a group of people, right? Or if it's just two objects, I mean, that's what it is in science and physics, right? These two things that are put together, tie your truck to the boat and then pull it and there's tension, right? We get that. Or two ideas, and that's where it gets personal because sometimes in our own lives, we have ideas you know, or values, or things that we hold on to that might be in competition with one another, or intention. So, for instance, we all feel this. I need to be saving some money for the future, for retirement, for the rainy day. But I also want to buy some stuff, and then I'm supposed to give. Tension. See, it's not just save and spend, it's save, spend, and give, right? And it's like, ah, there's tension, and you feel it. If you feel like I'm supposed to be saving some money or if you don't have any savings, right, or if you don't have any retirement, you're getting close to that. Every time you spend something, you're questioning whether I should be doing this because you feel the tension. And then I stand up here with a card and say, and I want you to give a little more. Oh, my goodness, he's killing me here. And that's what it feels like. We have this tension when we're we're supposed to love our neighbors as ourselves and love other people and be others-focused. But yet I got some needs and issues too. Tension. If you're in marriage you understand this because <laughs> it's my spouse and their needs and their wants and their desire. Tension because that pulls against mine. Then you add kids. 
Oh, my God, tension, right? Everything. Add a dog. Oh, my gosh. It's like, it's just crazy. <laughs> tension. Even within myself. Just put me on an island <laughs> and give me some resources and put up a couple of stores. And there's what I want and what's best. Sometimes it's what I want and what's right. Because I want some stuff that I know is wrong. I mean, whether you agree with God's law or not, I know there's some things that are just wrong. And yet I want them. It's tension. So here's the question I want you to ask yourself. What is it that you're holding on to? What are the things that you're holding on to that seem to be pulling in different directions that's causing the tension? Right? Because here's the thing. The greater the gap, the greater the tension. The greater the gap between what I want to give and what I feel like I can give, the greater the tension. And it becomes uncomfortable. It becomes stressful. It even becomes painful. And that's why we want to avoid it or ignore it. But here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Whatever the tension is in your life, whether it's with a person, whether it's with a group of people, Right? Whether it's with scriptures and something that you read in the Bible or, or maybe something you feel like God wants you to do or a change that needs to be made or, or maybe personal habits and appetites or whatever. Whatever it is, I want you to pay attention to the tension. Pay attention to it. Lean into it. When I hold up the card, when you're walking out with the card, when you're sitting around with this card, some of you don't even want to walk out with it. You're going to leave it in the seat. You're going to do whatever. But here's why. Because I don't want to walk home with this tension. I'm just going to leave it sitting right there. But pay attention to the tension. Because, see, tension can be an indication of danger and it can be an instrument for growth. It can be a warning sign, but it can also be something that is very beneficial. I've asked my wife to come help me illustrate this a little bit. So come on up here, honey. All right. Um, and she doesn't know what I'm doing other than using her as an illustration. So this is going to be great. Okay, so here you are. Just step right over there. I want you to grab this, okay? Get, get, no, get your hand in there. Yeah, thank you. Love your husband, okay? <clears throat> so here's the thing. You understand that there's things that she wants, things that I want, right? There's, there's goals that she has in life, goals that I have in life. There's a way that she sees marriage, a way that I see marriage, right? And here's the thing. <clears throat> Do you see her face? Did you, I, that's why I didn't tell her what was going on, because I wanted to capture that moment right there. <laughs> That's, that's what I wanted. You, you feel that. I mean, it's like, oh, Lord, we feel it. Where's it going? Don't, ooh, ah. And notice what happens. The farther we get from each other, the more our faces start with each other. Okay, Yeah, we got all of that. Now, here's the thing. This is a warning that somebody might get hurt. You see, as long as, as a spouse, as long as I am pulling away from her when I should be moving towards her, there's going to be tension. And so some of you, with your spouse, you go into the marketplace, you go whatever, or you go to the gym, and when you go to the gym or you go to work or you go to wherever you go, come on, guys, that girl's there, and she catches your eye and attention, and you keep wanting to look. Next thing you know, you want to have a conversation, and the next thing you know, there's something going on in your heart and in your mind. And listen, everybody feels it. She may not know it, but you do because there's tension. And the more you pull away from the one you should be moving towards, the greater the tension will be there. It happens whenever it comes to spending. It could be that, hey, we're way over here, and we're trying to save for the future, and we got to take care of college and aging parents and blah, 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 and all that kind of stuff, right? And yet, she wants to go shopping and go buy some stuff and all that, and she'll move. And I may not know it, but eventually I'll see it, right? But the whole time she's in the store, there's tension because we're moving away from what we should be moving towards. It's that way with God. It's that way with God. When we know that we're moving away from God, and it's not a matter of just like blatant sin and gross stuff. It's just we know what God wants for us, and we're moving in a different direction. And the farther we get, the more we move, the more tension we experience. See, that tension is a warning that if you keep going, somebody's going to get hurt. But it's also an instrument of growth. Because it's pulling you back in the direction you should go. Now, here's how you can relieve tension, right? You relieve tension by moving in their direction. Or 
Some of you have experienced this. I get so tired of the tension. I just let it go. So here's the thing. If you just let it go, listen. I, and, and when you did it in your marriage, it wasn't just dropped it to the ground. You snapped it. You wanted them to hurt. You aimed it at them. Right? Some of you have done this with friends. Some of you have done this with what used to be friends or coworkers or whatever the case may be. Some of you have done it to God and say, you have disappointed me and I can't stand the tension you've caused in my life. And so you have cursed him and walked out and you're done. You've done it to people who have disappointed you because they were moving in a different direction and you aimed it and you snapped it. Thank you, honey. They'll give her a hand. She did awesome. So here's the thing, if I, if I, if, if somehow, if the band was to snap, if it just got too tight, too much tension, and it snapped, and somebody gets hurt, that tension is serving as a warning sign. If the tension in your marriage snaps, not only does your spouse get hurt, but your kids get hurt, your friends get hurt. In some ways, our whole community and culture suffers. It's not just between the two of you. There's a lot of people who get hurt. You know this. It's the same thing with God. It's not just that it breaks God's heart, but that band comes back and snaps on you too. You get hurt. Breaks his heart. A lot of other people hurt in the process. But here's the thing. If if that thing was to snap, not only does it hurt, you lose something important. You lose a person who is important. You, You lose an idea or a value that was important. Right? And so it can be as a warning. But it can also be used to maximize your potential, to maximize or even increase your capacity. You see, they use these for growth. Stretching with these bands is what grows your strength and your muscles and your joints. And we don't like tension. We want to avoid it. We don't want to have conversations about money in church, and we don't necessarily want to have conversations about our appetites, and we don't necessarily want to have conversations and conflict with our spouse. But but yet it's, it's for our good that we do this. See, not all tension can be or even should be resolved. It can't be. It can't be. Not all tension can be or should be resolved. There was somebody, you know, I work with churches sometimes and do consulting on their finances. And so I, I've come across some churches at different times. They have endowment funds. In fact, we've had people here who have said, we ought to start an endowment fund. And I'm like, wow, that'd be great. Why would we do that? You know, an endowment fund is where you get, you know, a lot of money kind of piled up at first. You invest it in something, and then you live off of the interest and kind of little payouts over time. It's kind of like a retirement plan plan for a church. And that's exactly what it is, a retirement plan for a church. Stress the word retirement. Because all the churches that I've met who do this pretty much are retiring from doing the work of God. They're retiring from the transformation of lives, that's for sure. Because here's what will happen when you say, but it'd be great if we just kind of store up a million dollars and live off the interest because what that will do is that will now relieve the tension and the pressure. I don't have to get up here and ever have a conversation with a pledge card again. I don't have to get up here and talk about, you know, money that we need to do something else. I mean, all of that tension goes away, right? It's awesome. And so here's the thing. We would just let go of that tension, but we also let go of something else important. Because, see, here's what endowment funds do. While they relieve the tension of a campaign, they also relieve the tension of personal giving. Because you won't have to give. We got an endowment fund. And yet God designed us to be generous and to be givers. And if we're going to be like him, he is generous and he is a giver and he has lavished us with all kinds of stuff. God designed us not to think of ourselves, but to think of others. And listen, whenever that pressure is off of us, we don't have to look to the needs of others. And if we do, it doesn't have anything to do with us. We got an endowment fund. And so by relieving that pressure, come on, you know this, parents, leave your kids millions of dollars of inheritance. And it's like, wow, I just released all the financial pressure on their life. And they never work. And they get greedy. And they get self-centered. It's why some of the wealthiest billionaires in the world said, I'm not leaving my kids my money. Right? It's like, why? You can relieve all the financial pressure. Because if you relieve the pressure and the, the, the tension in one place, you just move it somewhere else. And see, that's how it is with God. Our vision is greater than our goal, and it always will be. And your vision for your life needs to be greater than your capacity. 
Always. Because if your vision is not greater than your capacity, first of all, you won't need God. Secondly, if your listen, if your vision is not greater than your capacity, just like if our vision isn't greater than capacity, then there's no unifying thing that pulls us together, no problem to solve, nothing we all have to come together with to do. And listen, there's no motivation to reach our potential or maximize potential, and there's really no motivation to grow. You see, tension is necessary for growth and movement. Just for me to be able to stand upright and walk, you too, there's tension. You know, several weeks back around Mother's Day, my, my mother broke her, yeah, she rolled her right ankle and fell on her left knee and broke the kneecap completely in half. And so the doctor said, you need to keep this perfectly straight like this because, he said, Ms. Ballington, you, you've got a, a tendon that attaches to the bottom and a tendon that attaches to the top. And when you bend, those things are pulling the kneecap apart. We need to keep it together. We don't want to put any tension on your kneecap because just standing up and just walking requires Tension. So for you to be able to move requires tension. And of course, you go to the gym or go anywhere else or get these kind of bands. Wow, you, you need tension to be able to grow and to, and, and to gain strength. And physical therapy. My goodness, with my parents right now, they got more physical therapy lined up. I'm going through physical therapy for their physical therapy. It's crazy, okay? And here's the, when you go through physical therapy, anybody who's gone through this, they'll tell you, it is almost all stretching. Almost all of it is stretching, moving your shoulder away you don't want to move it, moving your leg away you don't want to move it. It's all about stretching, and, and that's because they're trying to increase your mobility and increase your strength. And so here's the thing. It, it, is, it is introducing tension where you don't want it introduced, and it's managing tension you already have. That's physical therapy. You say, well, I don't like that. I want to get rid of all of that. Well, the absence of tension Results in apathy in your heart, you just don't care, and atrophy. Your body will wither up, you know this. Lay somebody in the bed for a long period of time, and I don't care how young they are. When we send astronauts into space, they come back, and sometimes their muscles have atrophy, and, and they're having to go through some physical therapy. Why? Because if there is no tension, there is no strength, there is no growth. Now, Jesus modeled this for us. He modeled how to live with tension, not to resolve it. It's the Son of God. He didn't come in here to say, I have no tension in my life. He modeled how to live with tension, and then he leverages tension. He introduces it to us. He, he brings it into our life so that it will make us more like him. It's that tension that pulls us back into the image of God in which we were created. Think of this. Here's Jesus who is standing between God and people. That's tense. And then he talks about the kingdom and the kingdom. And what I mean by that is he talks about the nation, the kingdom of Israel, right, the nation, the Roman Empire. But then he talks about the kingdom of God. And you see, there's tension between what it is to be an American and what it is to be a follower of Christ. There's tension between our nationalism and our loyalty to the kingdom of God. And they're not always in sync. In fact, sometimes they are pulling very hard against one another. And it doesn't mean you're not to be patriotic. It doesn't mean that we're not to be faithful and loyal to our country. But we do need to realize that there is something bigger and something greater we're to be loyal to. And at times it will put us in tension. It's why when we go to elect our you know, political leaders, we're just in so much angst. And it's like because somebody will say, well, that's Jesus's candidate. And we'll go, they're nothing like Jesus. Tension. This is God's man, and they're nothing like God. Tension. And so Jesus points this out, and he just lives in the middle of it. Because then when he teaches us how to pray the Lord's Prayer, he said, you know, thy will be done, not mine. Tension. As it is in heaven, let it be on earth. Tension. <laughs> right? And then, for all of us who said, I'm just so tired of this evil world, and it's just awful, Jesus, just come on back. Today's a good day. Take me home. Right? He prays a prayer for us, and he says, Father, my prayer is that you not take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. That you don't relieve the tension. You just protect them from the harm. Wow. And realize, again, not, I, I will use the illustration like this from time to time. Please don't, you know, go where I'm not going. I'm not saying, you know, homeschooling's wrong. I'm not saying Christian schooling's wrong. I'm not saying all that kind of stuff. You need to decide that for your family and everything else. But I will tell you, we do everything we can to insulate our kids and ourselves from the culture and from the world. And then when they get out from under our shelter, they, some of them go hog wild nuts. And you go, what happened there? 
because we were trying to relieve some tension in their life, which good parents will do, it just shifted to somewhere else later in life. And then at some point, it snaps. And they don't have the capacity or the strength to withstand the culture that they cannot avoid. You see, that's why Jesus says, don't take them out, just keep them safe. Right? And then he says this, like sheep among wolves, that's how I'm going to send you out. Oh my gosh, tension. Can you imagine if you were in that conversation being sent out? They have a little tense now. Right? When they, asked, when they were looking at Jesus, hey, he's the son of God, the Messiah. He's coming in and all oh, is all going to be peace, peace, wonderful peace. He says, don't think I came to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. Tension. There will be tension and separation. He said, in other words, there's going to be such a sharp division over me, over him as the Messiah. Jesus says, over me, there's going to be such a sharp division. It will be father pulling against son. It'll be mother pulling against daughter. It is going to be, uh, don't think I came in here to go, ah, oh, no tension. I came to introduce tension like you have never seen before. It's why you don't talk about politics or religion around the dinner table. Tension, right? Come on, you've seen this. You experienced this. You experience this when your kids are, you have a set of values and your kids start to take a different set of values. Tension, right? And so then Jesus himself embodies this. Fully God and fully man. How is that possible? Right? Deity and humanity. Right? Eternally existing, never been created, always been to someone who was born. And then we saw him die. How, how is this possible? How does God die? Oh, he can't do, God can't die. And then he was raised from the life. So maybe he didn't die, but we saw him die. Tension. I mean, he embodies this. And this is what John is pointing out when he writes in his gospel. The word, this is, this is God's plan. Like if you, if you were going to start a business, you'd sit down a business plan and you'd write your mission and your vision and your values and, and your strategy and what you want to accomplish and what's important and how you're going to do that. You, you would write down, you know, kind of how you expect your employees to conduct themselves and how you want the, the community to see you. And I mean, all of that stuff, you might write down the financial plan and how you're going to fund it and how you're going to take care of it and all of that kind of stuff, right? If you were to write this down, we would get an insight to you, what's important to you, what your goals are, Right? your likes, your dislikes. We could read a good, solid, beefy business plan and know something about the business owner. Same thing if, if you were just going to, to write down a plan of, of a group or a movement, or if, if you were going to start your own political movement, you would write down what's important. And we'd know something about you because of the plan that you wrote down. This is God's word. This is his intention, his heart, his vision, his dream. It's all laid out there in script and, and in words. And it says, and the word became flesh. Ooh, tension. Because now it's not words on a page, it's not ideas, it's not, it's not the words on the mouth of a prophet. It's a person who's walking around. And he made his dwelling among us. Okay, let me, let me describe the tension this way. We always think, oh, yay, God's with us. <laughs> like we're all perfect and can like, tolerate God being with us. Let me put it this way. We're all criminals and the cop just moved into your house. There you go, right? We're all criminals. And the cop just moved into the house. Oh, my goodness. You don't go to sleep at night the same. You go with tension. What will they find? What will they see? The creator, the word, all of the ideals of God became flesh and moved into our neighborhood. You don't sit there and go, whoo, I feel warm and fuzzy. It's like, I'm nervous now. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, tension. There's so many gods and so many religions and so many philosophies and so many ideals. And then John uses the word, he's the one and only, because Jesus said he was the one and only. Well, that's, that just puts me in so much tension, because I really thought in my world I was the one and only. That it was all about me, who came from the Father, and then here he is, full of grace and truth. And those things sometimes seem to be pulling in different directions, don't they? He goes on, he says this, for the law, you know, all the rights and wrongs and what God wants, was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So here's the thing, we got the law and there's no tension. This is how you live and this is what you do. And in some of those laws, if you don't, we kill you or banish you. Boom, no tension. 
But then Jesus comes along and says, yep, absolutely believe all of the truth and all of the law, but we're going to have some grace and everybody doesn't get banished and everybody doesn't get stoned. And we're like, wait, what? What? You see, Jesus came in and introduced so much tension. You see, grace without truth is confusing. Truth without grace is condemning. But together, they're curative. They're healing. Here's what I mean by that, okay? Um, grace without truth is confusing. And there, there's all the grace people. We just love everybody, and God wants to love everybody, and Jesus loves everybody, and Jesus would never condemn, and there's no such thing as hell because God would never send anybody to hell, and he's such a good God, and he's such a well, and it's just come as you are, and everybody's going to be okay, and we're all going to end up all right in the end. That's just really confusing because there's a lot of people who have been embraced and celebrated and applauded as they move farther and farther from God's word and God's will. And when they get as far as they can go, they're wondering, why am I not happy? And why am I depressed? And I did all of this and went to all these extremes and, and, and did everything that would be fulfilling and everybody applauded me and gave me love and grace. And why am I still suicidal? And why did everything I put my hope in turn out to be hopeless? This is just confusing because everybody seems okay with it. See, that's just confusing. But then truth without grace is condemning. Any of you ever gotten sick or had a loved one get sick and you just go on to Google to start searching out what it is they have? You know what I'm saying? Doctor said you've got some condition. You're like, I don't even know what that is. So you go to look it up and you just read it on Google. Like you do your own medical training. You go to you put yourself through medical school right there in five minutes on a Google search. And you're like, oh my gosh, this is awful. Would you look at this? It's just, ah, have y'all done that? That's truth without grace. It's condemning. It's why the doctors will say, don't do that. You'll freak yourself out. You'll freak everybody else out. You, you, have, you have a bookkeeper that comes and looks at your books and says, oh, my gosh. And, we're fine. and it's like, I can't believe you made all these decisions. I can't believe what you did. This was the dumbest stuff you've ever done. You're going to get in trouble with the IRS. You're going to get into trouble with like legal stuff. You probably ought to go to jail. You definitely need to declare bankruptcy. Your children are doomed. You're like, oh, all that may be true, but oh, it's condemning. What you want is a doctor to come in who knows everything that's on Google and the medical journal, but also takes into account your family of origin, your history, your lifestyle up to that point, what you, can, what you can bear, what you can understand, and what you can do to adjust. And so anchored in truth, full of grace, but the tension in that separation draws you towards the truth. He'll say, listen, you need to really start dieting and exercising. You need to stop what, you know, eating some of that junk food. You need to start walking. That is absolutely true. But here's the thing. They can walk you back through that gradually. Grace and truth. That's what you want. Jesus did this. One day he's teaching, and a woman caught in the act of adultery is brought before him. The man's not there. I think, this is just my opinion, I think the religious people who brought this woman set her up so they could set Jesus up. And the guy was part of it. So by the time he got her seduced or whatever and ready, he's out of the picture. She's guilty, and they drag, him to, drag her to Jesus to make a point. And they said, the law says anybody who's doing adultery is to be stoned, right? Here's the thing. There was no tension here. The law says to be stoned. Let's kill her. What do you say, Jesus? And he kneels down at her level and gets in the dirt where she's laying, scribbles in the dirt, have no idea what he said. That creates tension because we all want to know what he said, what he wrote. Stands back up and he says, okay, you're right. But let the one of you who does not have any sin be the first one to cast the stone. You go first. And suddenly the tension enters their heart when they realize how far they are from fulfilling everything God's law says. You see, suddenly the tension that they thought they had resolved just moved somewhere else. Right here. And so they dropped their rocks and they walked away. And Jesus doesn't then remove, remove the tension and say, it's okay, baby, we love you, God loves you, don't worry about it. No, 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 no. He upholds what they said because what they said was right. But he introduces so much tension by embracing her and giving her grace and saying, I'm not going to condemn you, and I'm the only one here who has the right to. Go and sin no more. 
What they said was right. What the law says is true. But I'm willing to stretch as far as I can with grace and love. And as you walk away from here, that tension in your life where you go, I should have died today, but I didn't. And suddenly there's something on the inside of you that just creates so much tension that it draws you closer to the one who gave you grace. That's what he does. He did it with a man who was paralyzed at a pagan temple. It was called the Pool of Bethesda. It was a pagan temple where people went to this Greek God who would sometimes heal people. And we know he's a Jewish guy because after he's healed, first place we see him is in the temple worshiping God. And Jesus shows up at the pagan temple on his turf in his territory and says, do you want to be healed? The guy says, I can't get into the water. You know, it's superstition here. Whenever the water gets troubled, then, you know, this God's going to heal us or these angels from this God's going to heal us and and nobody will help me in. He said, I didn't ask that. Do you want to be healed? And the guy's, yes. He said, then pick up your bed and walk. Tension. Tension. Because here's the thing. This guy now has to put his faith and his trust in Jesus, and he now has to, like, step out on doing something. It's just, it's just what you're asking me to do is so far from what I am able to do. There's so much tension. And then when Jesus finds him in the temple later, he says, I see you're doing a lot better. Hey, stop sinning or something worse will happen. It doesn't mean that, oh, God's going to inflict all kinds of punishment on you. He's just saying, look, do you realize there are consequences to sinning? And I think here's what he's saying. Stop going to pagan places for things that only God can do. And stop looking to the world's explanations and all that kind of stuff for things that only God can satisfy. You need to quit going there because I guarantee you, the farther you get from God, the more you move away from God, the greater the consequences where eventually you will be tempted to let go. And you will lose something very valuable. So how do we do this? How do we live with tension without being pulled in every direction? Because if I pull hard this way, this goes. If I pull hard this way, this goes. How do I do this without just being yanked all over the place by my spouse, by my kids, by my work, by the culture, by my appetites, by all the desires? How do we do that? Here's how you do that. Truth has to become the immovable anchor point that keeps us from drifting from God and his will. In other words, you've got to figure out and decide, and this isn't really hard, okay, so I'll help you, but you've got to figure out what is timeless, lasts for all times, what, what crosses all generations, what crosses all cultures, what is never changing, what is absolutely true, what is reality, not what I want to be reality, not what the culture tries to tell me is reality, not that reality other people paint, what is absolutely true, and it is true scientifically, philosophically, religiously, spiritually, emotionally, relationally, and in all the other E's. It is true. What is it? What is it is true? Anchor into that. Drive a stake so deep it is immovable. And here's what I want to tell you, okay? Give you a hint. Truth is a person, not a principle, not a precept, not a law. Now, you may have not come to this realization, and you may still wrestle with this because of tension in your life, but Jesus said of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It was the word of God, which we believe has to be true. It's God. He created. He started everything. He's self-existing. He determines all things. And so his word became flesh. It's true. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth. So it's a person. We anchor in the person of Jesus Christ. What he said, what he did, how he lived life, how he told us to look at life. Even when we read all the Old Testament and the prophets and all that stuff looking backwards, we do it through the lens of Jesus. Because Pharisees, Sadducees, religious leaders, all kinds of pastors, people like me have their interpretations and their versions of what all that stuff means. But Jesus, he gives us the lens through how we interpret and how we look at it. He is the truth. When he stood before Pilate on trial and Pilate said, what is truth? And he said, I am here to testify and tell you what the truth is. He said, anybody who's on the side of truth, they listen to me. Listen, He said, if you don't listen to me and you don't do what I'm telling you, you're like a person who is building your own house, which is great that you can build your own house, but you're building it on sand. And when the storm comes and it falls over, there is nobody to blame but you. But if you listen to my words and you do what I'm telling you, you're building on a solid foundation. And when the storm comes, it'll stand. And let me tell you this, even if it doesn't, at least you can blame Jesus. But there's nobody to blame but you when you ignore truth, reality, You see, God gave us his law through Moses, and then he sent the judge. 
Because his son will judge all of us. And his son moved in and moves into our homes and into our lives. But here's the thing. He doesn't move in to be the judge. He moves in to be our defense attorney. He knows all of the law. He will judge according to the law. But he's not there to get us off by a loophole. He is there to administer the law with mercy. That's what a defense attorney does. It doesn't hide your guilt. I mean, maybe the crooked ones. But the other ones will say, you're guilty. So here's the plea deal, and here's the best we can offer because I'm going for mercy. And that's what the judge is doing in our life. You see, here's what Peter said to people who were being pulled in all different directions because of persecution and death and everything they were being threatened with. He says, but you, in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Determine that he is truth, that he is reality, that he is the stake in the ground, that what he says, what he does, the example he lived, the claims he made, the promises he gave, all of that, drive it into the ground so that no matter what kind of tension you're under, it doesn't move. That's what it means. Have him as Lord. He calls the shots. He determines what's right, what's wrong, what's up, what's down. He's the one who decides everything. And then like a rubber band, grace extends out from there to everyone. Listen, who is living in ignorance, they don't know better, or they're living in defiance to the truth. They are so far over there. Here's truth, but they are so far out there. And grace, like a rubber band, can stretch all the way out to reach them. Because here's the thing, it's stretched all the way to reach us. And we find ourselves living in tension because here's what we know. What Jesus says is true and the example he lives is how I'm supposed to live. And I'm so far from that. Oh my gosh, I'm so far from that. And the tension that he still embraces me and loves me and wants me is what pulls me closer and closer. It's why when we have conversations about giving or when we have conversations about praying or when we have conversations about reading God's word, we all feel the tension because we all know if I'm going to be like him, I got to move towards him. And that tension is there. See, that's what my role is sometimes as a pastor, not to come in here and make you feel all at ease, but to introduce some tension in your life. You see, the creator, God with us, not God done with us. But no matter how far heaven was from earth and no matter how far we were from him, God was with us. He stretched to come to us. And the grace is that tension that pulls us towards him. It's what Paul was talking about to the Christians in Rome when he wrote, and he said, hey, don't take this time that he's given us for granted. God's kindness, his tolerance, his patience, all of that's a good way of saying his grace. He reminds us, don't you realize it's his kindness that leads to repentance? The fact that we're so far from him and he comes after us and in our hearts and in our souls and our minds, he puts so much tension there that we cannot stay away, that we are drawn towards. Do you not realize it's his kindness? Not the, I'm going to get you. Not the, I'm done with you. But it's the fact that he holds us in tension and he wants us to be like him. See, our capacity to love determines our capacity to stretch. Our capacity to love is the elastic. See, I could have used a rope, but a rope doesn't stretch. I could have used a belt, belt doesn't stretch. I could use a chain, chain doesn't stretch. Our love is like the elasticity in this. And here's what will happen. We have the ability to love until we don't. And then we get to a certain group of people or that person or a situation or an issue or whatever it is, and suddenly we're like, oh, no more elasticity, it breaks. And when it breaks, people get hurt and something gets lost. This is what Jesus said to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Whoa. In other words, warning. You're not experiencing the tension you should be. You need to have some tension in your life. So I'm going to introduce it right now. And it is a warning. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees. Hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin. Listen, these things grow over there like crazy. They are cheap. What he is saying is, you are so committed to the law of God, where it says to give 10% of all of your income, of everything that God gives you, everything. You are so precise. You are so astute in the law that you're going to take the stuff that is like worthless. You're going to take the things that is just so abundant. No, I mean, it's pennies, but you're going down to like pennies of pennies, like parts of pennies and making sure that you give 10% of even your spices. That's how committed you are to the law. In other words, you are anchored in truth, but you've neglected 
more important matters. What? They were sitting there and said, no, the law is the most important matter. We have driven the stake in the ground. For them, it was the law of Moses. For us, it's Jesus. I'm committed to that. Some of us so committed to Jesus. But you've neglected the more important matters. That's what the law is trying to get us to. Justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Justice and mercy seem opposite. You can't have justice and mercy. You can't have justice on the woman in adultery and have mercy and let her go. I mean, come on. You can if you learn how to live with tension. There is justice. And there is mercy. It's just that they're held in tension. Right? And then faithfulness, they would say, we've been faithful. Guarantee you we're faithful. I'll, I'll put my faithfulness up against anybody. <laughs> Here's what he's saying. Listen, you should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You've been faithful to the law. You should have done that. You've not been faithful to God's people. You see, all of this about the law and about Jesus that's so anchored is so that we now have the ability and the capacity to stretch to people who are condemned by the law but need mercy and grace that it will pull them back into alignment and into relationship. You see, justice and mercy are often in tension. Often in tension. I mean, how, how do you preach justice and yet show mercy? By being faithful to God's law and the truth. And also being faithful to God's people that he loves and created and gave his son for. You see, the love of God's law should not make us let loose of God's people. The love of God's people should not cause us to let loose of God's law. And that's what so many churches are feeling because they want to release the tension. And denominations are splitting over this. And some have held on to people and let go of the law. Some are talking about holding the law and let go of people. And I'm saying we need to be the kind of people who know how to live in tension. Listen, when our capacity to love others snaps, people get hurt. And then God gets misrepresented and misunderstood because they feel like God did it to them. But following Jesus stretches our capacity to love one another. It stretches our capacity. I mean, we grow in our capacity. We're learning to get stronger and stronger and stronger as our capacity to love. Listen, as a physical therapist will use tension to recondition your body, Jesus will use tension to recondition your soul. If you stop following Jesus, well, I'm just not going to do that, Jesus. I know what you said. I'm just not going to do that. Then you'll stop loving. And there'll be some people out on the periphery at first, but eventually there'll be people in your home that you stop loving. And if you say, well, I'm just, I just can't love them. You just asked too much, God, for me to embrace and love them. Then you'll stop following. Because if you're going to follow, you're going to love. If you're going to love, you're going to follow. And you'll stop doing this even if you believe, because there's a lot of people who believe in Jesus, but they do not love people. There's a lot of people who believe in Jesus, but they are not following him into the world, the culture, to reach people. Listen, love enables us to hold firmly to God, firmly to truth, and also to hold firmly to others who are in need of grace. And the farther they are from God, the more they're moving the other direction, the greater the tension in our life. And I understand that sometimes we snap. I get it. I do too. But Jesus wants to reintroduce the tension. You see... Our love for others is what will compel us to stretch. You can sit there and say, well, I don't have any money to help do stuff at the church or do whatever and to give to stuff. I don't have any money until it's your kid or your parents. And then you figure it out. I'm telling you, the last few weeks I've been with my mom and dad and they've been doing some health issues and it has been incredibly demanding and I don't have enough time in my calendar to put together sermons and do everything else and take care of mom and dad. But guess what? I was with them every day last week. You stretch. Why? Now, some of you say, but, but can you meet with me? Do you have time to meet with me? I don't have time to meet with you, right? I just don't have enough time. I can't figure it out. And honestly, I feel that way and the pressure and all that kind of stuff. I don't have time. But it was my mom and dad. I stretched. And I'm just going to be honest with you. I love my mom and daddy more than I love you. Hopefully you understand that. But God's using you to stretch my capacity to love so that I love people as much as I love my mom and daddy. Right? And so when it's somebody you love, you stretch. See, our problem isn't that we don't have enough time, money, or energy. It's that we don't have enough love. 
And he will use tension to grow our capacity to love. And when that happens, we grow our capacity to give and to serve and to be available for him. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to consider this. Some of you just need to start giving. You've never given. You never do that. And I want you to realize it's not about the money and it's not about like God needs your money. No, no, no. God wants your heart and he knows the way to get to your heart is to deal with money. Because that's what has most of your thoughts and your attention and everything else. And the way that he can get to your money is he can have somebody you love affected by your giving. So here's what you need to pray. Not God, give me more money. But God, would you help me love people that are right now outside of my capacity to love? Because when I love them the way that you love them, I will make myself available to them and I will give the way that you give to them. Now, if you need some training wheels, here's something that just came to mind. What if you just looked at some of your subscriptions? You know, like some of us have TV apps like Roku and streaming and all that, and we pay for subscriptions like YouTube Live or Hulu Live or whatever. And then we don't even watch those channels. What if you just did an inventory this week of the subscriptions you're paying for that you're not using or you don't use enough and just kind of knock those out, cancel those, and take the monthly amount and put it here? At least what you're doing is shifting the focus somewhere. That is more God-centered and truth-centered, right? Maybe you just said, you know what? I will skip one meal a week for a year. One meal, average meal. If you're going to go to McDonald's, it costs you over $10. So you just, I'm going to skip one meal a week for the next year. Gosh, if I do that, I'm going to be hungry. Uh Uh-huh, it's called tension. You'll also be focused, tension. It'll also stretch your capacity, right? Some of you tithing, 10%, 10% of everything down to my weeds? <laughs> I mean, seriously? That's what they were doing. Somebody said, that's crazy. Okay, why don't you just start with 1% or 2% because I promise whatever percentage you start at or go up to, it will introduce tension and it will cause you to reevaluate your needs and others' needs. What God is doing, what you want to do. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. Pay attention to the tension. And I don't want you to give out of legalism and law. This is what the Bible says, 10%. This is what the pastor asked. I want you to give out of love. I want you to give out of love. God, increase my capacity to love. And then next Sunday, we're all going to act together. And we're just going to demonstrate our love through our capacity and our willingness to give. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, thank you for using tension to recondition our hearts for the spiritual therapy you do on our soul by by putting us in relationships and friendships or even just in proximity with people that we would normally never have an association with. Heavenly Father, with people that are offensive to us, demanding of us. And Lord God, you put us in proximity or even in relationship with them and the tension in our lives sometimes is so unbearable. But God, You are helping us to flex our spiritual muscles and you're making us more like your son, Jesus, who who endured the tension between heaven and earth, between you and every sinner. Your son, who stretched enough to reach us. And by his love and grace and kindness and provision and mercy and all, Lord, that tension just pulls us closer and closer to you. Would you help us? Would you grow us? Would you be patient with us as you always are? Gentle with us as you always are. But Heavenly Father, I'm asking that you not relieve the tension, but that you leverage it to make us like you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray.